the final uh, panel of our technical tracks. So again, you know, just to provide some context, we already went through uh, nano, uh, the newer technology through space. That's where we started. And those are the tracks that we're starting again, like new in the next year. Um, then we picked it up with crypto commerce and AI. Those are the tracks that are already running within Foresight, uh, running strong with virtual seminar series um, uh, that, are, that are running once a week, twice a week, um, uh, you, you name it. We really have a lot of uh, virtual content these days. Uh, we also have the big biotech group, which you just witnessed. The biotech group is, I would say, our strongest group at the moment. Uh, I'm running sometimes back-to-back -back sessions in this one, and many of you guys are already, um, are already in there. And those are mostly virtual seminars, but also technical competitions throughout the year. Uh, one group that is really, really close to Foresight's heart, I should say, uh, on which, uh, on which promises Foresight really was founded is molecular nanotechnology. And we launched a molecular machines group with uh, James Cooper, who's a Foresight uh, fa fellow this year. Uh, he couldn't come due to COVID, but I could not be happier to have two of our 2022 Foresight fellows here who've made it all the way. And um, whenever I'm in our molecular machines group, uh, bear with us. This field is challenging, I think, um, to understand. But honestly, whenever I'm in these uh, virtual seminars, I just uh, like th those are the ones that inspire most existential hope to me just because of what we will be able to do in the next five to 10 years. It is totally, utterly mind melding. We've had already um, a few of our fellows present a little bit on the promises here at, in the San Francisco ones. I really, really recommend you guys check out their slides. It is really everything from human material interfaces to artificial synthetic life. Um, and it is just, it, it was a mind melt. So bear with us as we walk through our, our slides. It's really worth it. I think in our biotech group, the biggest advances in the next five to 10 years lie in the molecular machines uh, area. And so obviously I'm not the one to talk. You could, guys can do that much better than I, but I just really want to thank you guys for coming on as fellows in our next year. We're really fortunate to have you. You both are doing incredible work and I cannot really I wait to hear a little bit more about it. So let us uh, perhaps you start. Tell us a little bit about what it is that you are focusing on, an exciting goal for your field, and maybe um, what other fields could potentially help or how you could help other fields. I think you're more the tool developer for other fields, honestly. <laughs> yeah, that's probably right, Alison. Yeah, thank you. I'm really thrilled to be here and to be a 2022 Foresight Fellow. Um, this is actually quite new to me. I usually speak to chemists. So um, I'll do my best to try to explain like uh, what I'm doing and what we're aiming to do, which is um, getting out of equilibrium artificial systems. So we heard a lot about like live longevity today. Um, well, we all probably, most of us know, well, all of us probably know what proteins are, right? So we have huge structures and they're built out of amino acids. Hundreds of them form chains, then they fold into like intricate structures, and those then form bigger molecules, like bigger proteins, like hemoglobin is built out of four proteins rather than just one. And I'm doing that on the chemistry side. So basically I take amino acids and make bigger molecules out of them. But what I want to do, I don't want to make like bigger structures in equilibrium, but build them out of equilibrium. And, um, well, I'm in academic research. I just started uh, my group about a year ago. So everything's very fresh and new. Nothing's working yet, unfortunately, <laughs> I must admit. But um, so we're really trying to focus on and work towards getting artificial systems to assemble out of equilibrium. Because um, supramolecular chemistry, the field I'm working on, so basically building bigger structures out of smaller molecules, all operates inside equilibrium. And I talked to another uh, 2022 Foresight fellow, uh, Stefan, earlier, and he gave a very nice example of, physicist's example of what is out of equilibrium stuff. So it's basically like if you have a brick and it lays on the ground, you can't move it with a feather. But if you put it on one of the, ed uh, the corners, then a feather can, that's out of equilibrium. And with a feather, you can push it back into equilibrium. And that's what we are basically trying to do with chemistry and then understand better how out of equilibrium systems work, which is basically what life is. Everything is out of equilibrium. The cell operates out of equilibrium, which is why we eat cake to sustain ourselves during coffee break. Um, yeah, so it's very, very fundamental. Well, things that I basically need is um, organic synthesis, people doing like making molecules. Well, we do them ourselves as well, but other people focus on actually how to make molecules make it easier to make specific molecules that we can then use. Um, 
we're using loads of analytical techniques on a molecular level, mass spectrometry, NMR spectroscopy, which is basically uh, MRI on molecules. Sort of, it's <laughs> the same principle in there. Um, yes, and um, also a quantum chemistry calculations on actually getting the energy levels of our different systems and proving that they actually operate out of equilibrium. And the theory behind it, um, what makes actually out of equilibrium systems, Leonard Prinz and uh, Dean uh, Estimian, who also presented with Foresight, really, really did great work on that. And where we want to go with this, yes, <laughs> um, it's basically like, can we do this? We want to move uh, chemistry out of equilibrium and uh, do that like reliably, like have several systems. Other people are working on that as well, but there are only a few examples right now. Um, then we want to use that to maybe uh, convert light into chemical energy and thereby then be able, hopefully, to uh, actually operate molecular machines because for molecular machines to operate, they also need to be moved out of equilibrium. And um, yeah, the end goal would basically have a synthetic out of equilibrium nanotechnology where we hopefully can tie in our work with molecular machines and then generate new, uh, new stuff in nanotechnology. Thank you. Well, tell us just who here really knows what out of equilibrium does or why it's important. The yes, answer enders, I am not surprised that we have two people here. So perhaps just, and I know you already said it a little bit with the cake example, but like, why would anyone care about out of equilibrium? Um, what can we do with it? I know that you, you guys hate to speculate about applications, but yeah. this is a very speculative crowd. Yeah. Um, I mean, so, so far, so I'm, I'm also like, I come from the field of metallosupramolecular cages. So basically making cage-like structures, putting stuff in there, and then uh, transporting those th things to other places. And we can use them and, well, they always say like, oh, we can use them for drug delivery, separation and stuff like that. And this is all equilibrium chemistry. But then, as I said, life is out of equilibrium. So life is significantly more intricate than what we do in a flask generally. So, so my idea behind that was always, oh, I want to move out of equilibrium and see what we can do when we actually move out of equilibrium. I don't know, honestly, like I have no clue, but like, um, it's something that's completely unexplored and hopefully we have more ways to actually use things like that. So, so I probably, probably, this is a very, very timid example because I'm generally like very cynical. <laughs> yeah. But, um, so we want to use cages for transporting things, but because it's usually driven by thermodynamics and it's an equilibrium structure, whatever drug you put in that cage for drug delivery won't leave the cage. It's happy in there. It's perfectly happy in there. But if our Stru that drug delivery structure would be out of equilibrium, then we can actually release that drug again and have targeted drug delivery. So, so things like that. So basically moving away from what supramolecular chemists have been doing for quite a while, which is amazing stuff. That's why I started the field in the first place. Um, but I see a few of our longevity people going like, mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> okay, lovely. Uh, thank you, Larissa. Um, next on up, uh, we have Dionis. Or, um, D Dio. 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 Okay, good. I, I will from now on call you Dio. Um, and um, Dio basically came to us because William Shi won a Feynman Prize, um, uh, uh, which is our prize that we give out for work on molecular nanotechnology to uh, really support, uh, like, uh, to really support uh, ground groundbreaking work. And then he came back um, this year to give a virtual seminar uh, on his uh, work on DNA nanotechnology. And people were so mind blown that we then begged him to come on for a second one uh, that was still uh, off the record where he discussed uh, a continuation of his of his project and uh, and and then I, I reached out to him and, and he nominated uh, Dio as a fellow for the next year and so I, I am so mind blown what you guys are doing in DNA non technology especially with Chris Cross. perhaps explain to us a little bit like what is this why do people care what can we build what are end goals in this field and how can everyone else benefit from this sure. Yeah, thank you for having me. Thanks for um, yeah uh, accepting me as a fellow. I um, so I'm coming from a DNA nanotechnology field, and basically what we do is build structures out of DNA. So um, most of you know DNA as kind of our genetic 
um, encoder that uh, every cell has, but uh, we use it as a great building material. And the reason for that is that you can program the sequences specifically to bind at, um, to interact and bind uh, and actually form structures. And so uh, a number of years ago, uh, so the field was started in the 1980s by um, a guy called Ned Seaman that recently passed away. And he worked on basically how to, uh, you know, uh, make all of these different junctions. So how can you take a linear molecule and you make all these junctions to form sort of a, a, a geometry. And then uh, a number of years ago, there was uh, sort of, I would say like a big breakthrough uh, called DNA origami where uh, basically just like you fold a sheet of pap paper to um, make an origami structure, you can do that with a linear molecule out of DNA and fold that molecule into a structure. And this can be done in arbitrary two and three dimensional shapes since um, that beginning of, of the invention of DNA origami. And uh, so we, we use, use a combination of, of um, biologically derived and synthetic DNA to build different structures. And so uh, some of the things that Larissa was talking about in terms of performing certain functions uh, with those structures. So one can imagine like a little robot that has a payload and when it attaches to its target at a cell receptor, it opens up and it releases a drug or um, little uh, mechanical devices, little walkers um, that kind of walk along a track and carry some sort of cargo. So all those things have been shown in uh, the literature. And uh, one of the problems that uh, we're, we're addressing with uh, crisscross is, or, or I can talk about crisscross maybe after I go through this. So uh, basically um, the enabling technologies that have led to this field really flourishing, I think is you know, the accessibility to, to DNA uh, strands, so synthesis that we can use to then, or we can order them and then uh, fold our structures. And then um, also, uh, you know, a characterization methods such as, you know, electron microscopy that we use readily and um, some bulk characterization methods that are just standard molecular biology tools. But um, so one of the problems that is difficult to address in, in when you're working in self-assembly in general is that when you look at nature, you have this incredibly complex uh, system where you're building, um, you have all of these, these small proteins, DNA, RNA, uh, uh, peptides, lipids that all interact uh, through these uh, very intricate uh, coordinated um, uh, interactions and form very complex systems that can you know, operate um, and, and grow, right? So we are all made of them. And uh, it's difficult for an, a nanotechnology perspective to try to mimic that especially when you're, uh, we're talking uh, with what we're doing with uh, DNA to get basically from uh, just folding a single DNA origami structure to then folding multiple structures and putting them together. So many orders of complexity and higher order assembly. And so that was basically uh, a lot of the work that I focused on during my PhD and what William's group is working on is how can you do higher order assembly sort of uh, get to that, that place that nature, uh, nature is able to do. So how can you, how, how can a single cell grow into a human, right? Um, I, there's many levels of complexity and I'm simplifying here, but, um, crisscross, uh, is one of those, uh, technologies that we're really excited about because it basically lets us control the formation of a structure. And, uh, it's basically, you can imagine this, the analogy that we like to use is kind of the Jack and the Beanstalk, uh, story. You have a bean, you plant that into the ground and it grows into an amazing beanstalk, a huge structure. And, um, so similarly to that, we use a seeding agent, so a seed that then triggers the reaction and grows into these enormous structures. And, uh, we've shown some, uh, wide variety of structures that you can form with that both from individual, individually folded DNA origami, so structures that you have to, that fold themselves into, uh, you know, they're on the order of like 500 nanometers long, like five nanometers uh, wide, and they form uh, large, higher order assemblies, and then also from single strands of DNA triggering them into a reaction. Now, um, that's all, I, I guess the next question would be why, why, why is that useful? 
uh, a number of um, well, aside from the fact that uh, we think it's really cool and you and it's difficult to do, and so uh, we have fun uh, building these structures. Uh, the other thing that we can uh, imagine that it would be very useful for is, for example, if you build large scaffolds of things where you can precisely position. So that might be on the order of microns, but the actual addressability is still on the nanometer resolution. So you can pattern things and, uh, you know, can, if one might maybe extrapolate into the future, you could have little factories uh, or some, you know, where you can specifically arrange enzymes in a different, uh, in a specific order. Another one is uh, detection, uh, so in diagnostics, where only when a molecule or an analyte is present that we are trying to detect, it triggers this reaction. Great. Yeah. I think one of the earlier quotes about this field is um, asking what molecular nanotechnology can do, and many of the projects that you work on is asking what, um, uh, asking what computer science can do with bits. That is what molecular nanotechnology could do with atoms. And so I think this is always like a pretty mind mind melting uh, mind melting um, um, mind melting metaphor, even though we're obviously not there yet. And uh, okay, we have a question over here already. After it is in or the thing you actually to destroy it. So before it activates, you protect it, and then you want to destroy it. So I'm curious how do you solve this issue? Yeah, uh, yeah, this, those are great questions. I think that. Um, over the years, people have worked on first trying to preserve the structure. So what you're saying, you're you're in an environment where you have DNases, you have uh, maybe not the right salt concentration that keeps those structures together. Um, uh, so there's a number of papers out on that. So from our lab, for example, one could use oligolysine to coat the structure and uh, that significantly prolongs the lifespan. In terms of uh, degradation afterwards, uh, I guess um, the problem has been, at least to my knowledge, and I haven't specifically worked on this kind of drug delivery, uh, it has been more of how can we keep them uh, intact and then deliver uh, the the payload to the target. Um, as far as we're act in terms of end application, I think one of those things is uh, like actually using it, that's, we're quite far off from that, I think. So um, we're still struggling with some of those uh, issues that you mentioned. How can you preserve the structure? How can you make sure it only goes to target? And then afterwards, yeah, you might be able to want to clear it. So it's an ongoing field of research, I would say. And it's, I would say, still uh, a ways to go to actually use these, uh, you know, aside from the fact that the problems you mentioned, also the fact that it's, diff it's, it's, um, it's expensive, right? Because you need DNA, a lot of DNA. It's it's getting cheaper, but it's still not cheap enough, right? In comparison, to, yeah. The outer surface of this uh, DNA cage. What if you cover the outer surface of this DNA cage with a repellent material, which like repel the proteases and other enzymes, and when the cage is open, the inner surface uh, is susceptible to this. Uh, and yeah, we're already getting in the brainstorm. Yeah, yeah. I love it. Is it yeah. Yes, no, quick nod. Yeah, that could be a valid um, something. It could be also that uh, maybe one day we'll have bioorthogonals, um, you know, uh, mirror image DNA, um, and you just don't worry about it and just you're, it doesn't interact with your body and you, know, you just clear it out <laughs> through your system. Lovely. I love it. We're already seeing a few connections, I think, to be made between the longevity and the nanotech, uh, uh, and the nanotech uh, areas. Yeah, I'm really happy about that. I, I do want to note, it's interesting that many of you guys, throughout the presentations, always had something like ML, better measurement, better data, like more data, like all of that were always, some people had then more of the DAO side as enabling cap capabilities, but like, but I think like the enabling technologies actually were pretty um, you know, there was, there was big overlap for all of you guys. So that's, that's super interesting. And I think that you guys 
can actually be really good enabling technology for many of the biotechnology technology areas. So I would recommend you too, um, that when we finally have the breakouts in a bit, uh, that you actually also go around and shop at other trees and look how, how you can help those, uh, those people along. Um, okay. So do you want to leave us perhaps, uh, I mean, Larissa has already done so, but like with the final thing of like, what could we look forward to? I know that you mentioned drug delivery, for example, but is there anything else that you could mention uh, in terms of, you know, be just better materials uh, in terms of, you know, potentially lighter materials? Uh, is there anything for, for, for example, for, uh, you know, improving the way that uh, we currently uh, create energy that, uh, that you guys can look forward to in these technologies or, um, yeah, any, any other pl applications that people could potentially benefit from? Uh, yeah, I think uh, biophysical measurement tools. So things like I, I wrote down uh, something that, um, yeah, to determination of protein structures on like a very high throughput fashion so that um, we can do uh, uh, basically like a lyse a cell and then look at the entire uh, entirety of proteins there and like map them out. So there, there's some work in, in our lab, in the she lab, that's going towards that building these tools. Uh, ultra sensitive detection. I think that's something that I'm personally very excited about. So uh, detecting nucleic acids as well as the proteins in a very uh, um, high sensitivity and high specificity with uh, basically no uh, false uh, positives. Uh, that that's uh, that I think would be very looking forward to. I think that's where all uh, you know the molecular machines become or the work we're doing. That's kind of where I think it would be very very impactful. And, um, you know, we, we're working on this uh, diagnostics tool that works without enzymes. So how do you dry, like, you know, how do you trigger these reactions without using enzymes, which are typically the things that are used in uh, um, PCR and all the other variants that we are using, especially now during the pandemic. Yeah, yeah especially now. <laughs> Any final bits? It's, it's fine. You already gave us a great one. Okay. Um, that's already useful, as you can tell. Brilliant. Uh, yeah, one thing I actually uh, I probably wanted to mention that actually there is some molecular machines that are already working and fuel. Uh, Dave Lee is do doing some great stuff. And uh, a lot of things that out of equilibrium, because uh, Alison, you asked me what out of equilibrium can be good for. Um, well, many people are also interested on a very fundamental level, because if we understand out of equilibrium system, maybe we that can also trigger towards understanding the origin of life on a kind of like thermodynamic slash kinetic level. So. Lovely. Well, that would be nice. Um, okay, I have actually from the folks that you just mentioned, from Dave, me, uh, and, and Zina Stumian and a few others, I have those slides up here. If you, if you want to find more out about molecular machines, I really think in this time well spent. Um, okay, great. Thank you so, so much, guys.